Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Escaping Carcosa, Carcosa Online Edition. With me today, I have four amazing players who are going to bring you a story that'll blow your mind. But starting off, I will be your GM for the evening. My name is Lucas. My pronouns are he, him, Marquise. Hi, everybody. I'm Marquise, he, him, and I'll be playing Derek, who in the game will be known as Akihiko, he, him. Aubrey. Hello, I am Aubrey, I use she, her pronouns, and in the game, I will be playing Ryan, uh, who also uses she, her pronouns. And my character name in-game is Nisla. And Cassie. I'm Cassie, uh, pronouns are she, her, I will be playing Vanessa, pronouns also she, her, and, uh, the name of our character is Morrigan, or Mori for short. And Shen. Uh, hello, I'm Shen, he, him. I'm going to be playing Loon Cross, he, him, whose name in game is also just Loon. Last time, our four brave adventurers put on headsets after having a day. There was a figure there, and they watched each of them, the same figure. Who was this person behind the mask? But after our players had logged in, created their characters, they were flung through the sky down towards the city of Carcosa. Looking at the city of Carcosa, it sprawls outward. In the very center of it, while you were falling, you saw that there was what uh, a little label appeared above it, the guild hall. It's this large building that is sitting over top of a small area of water, it has little bridges leading over towards it. You see another area near that guild hall, is this area that's just covered with trees, is the dungeon. This is the entrance towards the dungeon that all the adventurers will be going through one after another, trying to clear those levels. Off to the northern tendril of the city, we see the Church of the Shining God standing brightly, shining on all the wonderful residents of Carcosa. Off on the right tendril, we see the marketplace, sprawling open area with many stalls and shops and people peddling their wares. You're falling faster and faster and faster towards Carcosa, but it comes down to a soft landing. As you look around, the buildings are sprawled everywhere. The strange thing about Carcosa is that it almost looks like the buildings themselves were plucked from different towns. Like you had just a mad scientist of a city designer just grabbing everything they wanted and slapping around. Even some places, it looks like the road is going uh, maybe cobblestone and then it goes a bit into gravel and then back to cobblestone. Like they just keep changing their mind. Some of the houses are fairly large, and while others are quite diminutive, we see an assortment of different species walking around. We see halflings with multicolored hair. We see large rock trolls. We see beings made completely out of light. We see all sorts of things, and looking over top of them, all of you can see these little player bios are popping up. Just you see, like there's a little bar. It shows their hit points. It shows their MP. It shows their name, uh, and there's a little spot for like pronouns as well, so it's easy to pick that up on different players. You're looking around, and tell me, what do each of your characters look like in this new world? Akihiko is what can only be described as the idealized version of a catboy. So he's currently wearing um, this, on the top half, you see most of his torso as only like Bits and pieces of it are covered by this uh, singlet. One arm completely co uh, covered by a kimono that is like wrapped around his waist or tied around his waist um, with a very obnoxious looking patterned bow. Um, and one arm is currently free with you see just like a, a fingerless glove going all the way up to uh, his elbow with a gold band around uh, the upper arm. Uh, his lower body, you see that like garters are holding these like um, dancers pants up to about mid thigh and he's currently barefoot. So normal human, um, just kind of like a, a really beautiful looking, uh, in a softer feminine way, younger man of darker skin tone with white hair, comes down in like two small tails in the, uh, framing his face at the front and then just like a high pony at the back and the tips of that are black as well as uh, his ears, his very large uh, Maine Coon ears, which are also <laughs> white with tipped in black and a very bushy tail uh, in the back. He's currently just like holding a staff in one hand and has a crossbow on his back. Nissa is a this is half dwarf, half elf. The best way to describe her figure is take an elf, but like shrink them down and make them a little bit stockier. 
So she's pretty much the same same height as uh, Ryan is in real life, probably about 5'1", five, 5'2". Five, and you know, she has what is probably very long, luscious red hair, but currently sort of done up in a crown braid uh, around her head. Uh, you can kind of see the little points of the elven ears sticking out from it. On her face, she has the little, like the kind of almost steampunk-esque spectacles. You know, sort of they're smaller and incredibly round and they look like they, they've got sort of like a blue lens on them and they look like you can probably just flick them up and they're just the regular glasses underneath. She is wearing a sort of this white shirt with like a, almost a bit of a scarf and a sort of blue skirt that goes down like below her knees and has got some a nice pair of heeled boots and then on over that she's wearing a blue trench coat that sort of has a bit of an angled cut near the bottom of it and you can kind of see she's got multiple bandoliers and things and one of the bandoliers has a, is a gun she also has her medical kit and another one of them and at her side she has a short sword Maureen is a bird she is a raven about four and a half feet tall and she's very graceful looking she's not overly muscular or anything like that but if you can imagine the look of a dancer but it's a bird that's her <laughs> so she has clearly a very strong beak that takes up the majority of her face but it's like it's glossy, it's not chipped or anything like that. She looks very clean, very well kept. And so her feathers have a nice sheen on them. Nothing is out of place. She's wearing a tunic, something with shorter sleeves, so probably like halfway between the shoulder and the elbow. This tunic is green, and there's a a like light rope belt where there might be a waist. Given a bird's form, you can imagine what that might look like, but it's giving it some kind of shape. Uh, we know the intention of this piece of clothing. Her ankles are also wrapped. She's not wearing any shoes. You can s clearly see the, the feet, the talons coming out of her raven's feet. And it's a very sim simple look, nothing crazy. She's unarmed. So there are no weapons. She just looks like if she hit you, it would probably hurt. For Loon, she's pretty much just wearing a white tunic covered by a black jacket, black pants and leather shoes. Black leather shoes. He has blonde hair, purple eyes, and he's kind of secreting a small amount of light from his fingers. And he's holding a staff with a red ball on the end you four are looking around there's all sorts of people are bumping into you. there's all sorts of smells you see, like the smell of freshly baked bread as it just wafts into the air your stomach is just gurgling you see that there is all sorts of you know like there's little stalls here there's buildings it looks like the buildings you can go inside of you see people there are residents inside these homes they look they must be npcs as they're kind of like poking, they're like, you know, pulling the curtains and like looking at everyone as you're you're all just wandering through. And some of them are stepping outside going like, oh, hi, hello. As you're, you're looking around this town and you're just overwhelmed by everything around you. But uh, the four of you can see each other. You also see like other people around you. You know, like there's a very large orc is, you know, they're, they're stepping by you, Akihiko. Oh, excuse me there. Yeah, I just have to get past you. Akihiko falls. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't I didn't mean to do that. And just kind of like looks up at the orc, but then looks down at his legs and for the first time in forever feels legs and begins to like wiggle them. Just like uh, one uh, touching the ground, bending just over and over again as he's just like trying to learn how to walk for the first time. Oh, are you... Are you lagging? I'm gonna get out of here. I don't... Um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're stepping over you. There's so many people. Think of it, it's like you're at a convention, right? Everyone's bumping mm -hmm. into everyone. That one nice thing is these are all brand new characters, so nobody smells, so it's not like that way in a, in a convention. 
So, you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a nice moment. So many things are going on. You see balloons are being released into the air. There are these like banners that are saying, welcome travelers. And uh, all sorts of like, you know, streamers are around. You can hear music is starting up. Some people are playing instruments and you can smell that, uh, you know, some of these stalls are starting up the, the fires in them and everything, getting some food cooked. Is there anything that you would like to do? I think uh, I, I'm like looking around, just kind of like taking everything in, kind of a bit, a bit in awe of just like everything and sort of like looking, I'm like moving my arms, just doing like feel all of this. And then probably just sort of look around at the people around me, kind of just wave and unsure of really what else to do other than just like wave, say hi, um, and I guess sort of the food is now tempting because now I have the idea. It's like, do, do I taste? Do I, do I have the ability to taste things if I eat them in here? Now I want to try that out. See, there's a stall. Someone's offering food. Like, the, come on over here. Get yourself something to eat. You know you're hungry. You know you want something. You want to taste a nice bite of this food over here. You're saying to yourself, you're saying. Oh, I could go for a snack, and I say I got it right here for you. Yeah, um... And then you see this this dwarf is, like, sitting behind this stall. They have a little paper fan, too, that they're they're making the smell go towards the crowd. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just go up and just be like, like, see what's available, uh, and just be like, how much is it? It's all, it's free day today, you get something for free. What do you feel like? You feel like you're real hungry? You feel like it's just a, a bit of a snack? Let's go with a snack. <laughs> oh yeah, all right. And so they, they start just like piling things onto this plate. It's not a snack. Uh, so they're getting this, this whole tray set up and they, they pass it towards you. You see that they're like, you know, some freshly cooked, uh, like bits of potato. You see that they, they have some like, there's like a kebab that's uh, set up on there. There's another, it's actually a salad, which you're surprised from coming from this stand. It looks like everything's being cooked. Why don't you go ahead and give that a taste? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, as I say, as I'm like moving slightly back from the stand, I, I don't know, I'm gonna like look over and maybe one of the other people is standing near me and just being like, you hungry? Loon, your stomach growls so hard. Loon just looks at, pretty much just looks at the window and sees reflection and he just says, Why do I look like a woman? And then he proceeds to go to a stall and saw a guy selling food, something that looks like food. And he approaches him and said, If I trade my stuff, can I have some food? You could just have some food today. Oh, free food. Looking at you, you look like you never ate a day in your life. Well, I didn't know he looked skinny, but... Oh, is it the hoodie? They start piling up, like, this pulled chicken and, like, you know, stacking up on this bun. Uh, they got, like, coleslaw beside it, that kind of stuff, and they, they shove it towards you. You want to taste that? It's free, right? Yeah. And then he just proceeds to grab it and leaves. Ma! Ma, is it free? Yeah, it's free. Oh, well, he was shouting that he, Loon just proceeds to grab the whole thing and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> just walk away. Oh, Loon just doesn't know he's a summoner. Like, he chose the summoner class, but he thinks he's an assassin. Pretty much. <laughs> but, but he's made out of light, so... <laughs> you sneak by. The, <laughs> you illuminate this alley as you try to kind of hunker down. And when the two of you taste the food, it is packed full of flavor your taste buds are just firing off you are amazed if anything it tastes so good as you're you just start eating and eating like you, you you're you're amazed at like the the fact that this video game is giving you so many senses the wind picks by you feel like your hair moving you feel like that you know like a little bead of sweat coming down then drying as the wind hits it, it it's just so immersive so Morgan, what are you doing? As the you see all these people around you, some of them are getting food, some of them are on the ground at the moment, moving their legs. Morgan is going to, much like other folks in the party, 
be sort of in awe at the scale of everything. I, I think that the, the trailers wouldn't have done it justice, that this feeling of being there is overwhelming. And as she like kind of comes out of like touching individual feathers on her arm and like feeling how real this this bird body feels and how light uh, you know hashtag hollow bones we are very light now she's going to notice this sort of you know stalls it's reminiscent of fair food it seems like and uh, see somebody who's clearly been overburdened by these servers with a tray although she wouldn't have put that together she's like in her mind, it's like hors d'oeuvres. They've got this big tray. They clearly can't eat it all, so they must be walking around offering it to people. So she's going to walk up and ask, Excuse me, uh, what do you have on this tray? I, there's so much. It's all touching. What what food is this? Um, and and uh, you know, she'll look at it. Uh, I'm just being like, I think there's some like, chicken, and then there's like a salad, too. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not actually probably going to eat that. Who comes to a video game to eat salad? <laughs> Morgan is going to uh, pick up a piece of chicken and go to put it in her mouth and she's going to realize that she doesn't have like a mouth anymore. She has a beak. So she's going to like mumble about like how do you even how, how do I even eat this? How do I how do I eat eat? So she, she kind of takes the tip of her beak just to try and takes like a little bit of chicken off Realizes that she doesn't have any teeth, and so she can't chew it. Uh, so just sort of swallows, is like, I guess that works. Just keeps, like, picking at it. I don't think she's really quite ready to just throw a bone in piece of chicken her back in her and mouth. look up at the sky. And, <laughs> and just, like, hot, hot, like, get it down. Uh, so in, in light of her realizing that she doesn't actually know how to eat it, she's going to become very embarrassed and go, oh, um, thank you. For the, this is all. This is this is all for me. And she's just gonna continue picking at it and looking around at that point. Akihiko, it is. It's taking a minute, but you're you're standing up. Your legs are are wobbling. Not so much because they're weak, but just because you're unsure of this situation. But you're. It's almost like there's a part of your brain, uh, and you're not sure if it's the game or if it's you. But there's something that's just kind of like it's it's helping you a little bit, kind of like it gets your balance as you're you're standing up. Much as you see some people who are, you know, they they chose these different uh, bird people are are like you know starting to soar and like starting to lift into the air. It's like there's an almost inherent of like this is how you use this body that you're not used to because some of your bodies may be taller than you are or shorter than you are, and so like even just walking normally can throw you off a little bit. You know, might stumble a little bit at first getting used to this this change. And so all of you are there, and there's, there's other players around you. There's these stalls, and then the, the sky, the storm cloud sort of rolls over. And it's, it's quite fast that it rolls over, and a lot of people are muttering and looking up at it, wondering what's going on. We see cracks of yellow leaking through the clouds above. Suddenly there is a figure that is slowly coming from these clouds. They look gigantic. It is clad in this tattered yellow robe. Their hood is pulled over. You can't quite see their face. They look like they must be at least 30 feet tall or so. They're very big. They are floating in the air above the city. A lot of people, you hear them muttering like, wow, this game's graphics are amazing. Just stuff like that as, as people are, are marveling this person above you you hear this voice echo out greetings my subjects I am your king pastor you have entered my domain though under false pretense you come here for glory you come here for adventure i will give you these things you wish to leave my domain come find me 
at the end of my dungeon. But know this. If you are to die in my world, if you let the last bits of life leak from your pathetic frame, you will die in your miserable dimension. A lot of people are murmuring, or some are angry. I'm like, fuck's this guy? As the, uh, you know, this, this figure is above them. They clap their hands, and a thunder resounds over this area. You all feel a strange sensation go over your body. Before, you could feel everything being here in this world. But now you can feel it more so. You feel suddenly the gravity of everything. You feel your clothing on your body a lot more as if it was actually on your body, but before there was a little bit of a disconnect. You feel your hair. You feel the how cool like the wind is making you feel. You're looking over at one another. Some people are are getting frustrated. You hear one person go, This game's too weird. You you see them opening up their their menu. What the hell? I can't log out. And then it starts. A chorus of people all opening up their menus, everyone trying to log out. What do you all do? I see if I can log out. It's grayed out. You go to select it, you tap it, nothing's happening. There's a little spot to contact an administrator, and it's also grayed out. I see everyone else doing that. Akihiko just kind of like starts looking around. Is there, like, God came down and proclaimed, you know, uh, here are the commandments, children. Yeah. Is there, like, a wave of locusts happening? (laughs) Because he's just, like, he's freaking out. You're like, are we in danger now? You see that the large figure is ascending back up into the clouds, but the storm clouds remain. You're looking around, and from what you can gather, just, like, every, it's just a slow panic is starting. And you know when people panic... People tend to stampede, move around, cause problems. So your brain is kind of telling you, you should probably get out of the center of the crowd. I think at this point, Morgan's not going to be uh, panicking like the others. And it's not because she's not responding. It's just that she's so used to having bodyguards or generally being in a position where like things have threatened the average person just wouldn't affect her. So she's still feeling fairly confident that whatever's going on, at the very least, it could be fixed for her. So she's noticed that the, you know, you can't sign out, that there's there's no contact to administrators, but the crowd is making her feel anxious. So she's going to start moving out of the town square, probably towards the trees on the north side. I actually think because I'm standing next to you and you seem to not be going, like, freaking out as much as everyone else, that I will be following you. Just because I'm just like, I... This isn't good. This is very not good. I I just, like, my idea is get to somewhere quiet and collect my thoughts, figure out what I'm doing. Well, for Loon, he's still kind of holding a plate. Once he felt the senses, you know, start to hide, and he just pretty much explained, oh, the flavors are melting in my tongue. And then he just... Pretty much saw the god and was like, oh, wait, I think it's wrong. And he just puts the plate down on the floor and starts walking towards the people are running to. Akihiko starts going north, but heading for the guild hall. Mm-hmm. It's the probably a location on the map that has the most information at the moment. You're all moving northward, and the ground slowly starts cracking. You see hands, skeletal hands, are pulling themselves out as these these skeletons are moving out. People start screaming and panicking and you see their guards that are in this area and they just sort of, their heads hang low as they stand almost like they've just been deactivated. No need initiative as these skeletons start pouring out.
Greeting, travelers. It's me, Wing of a Gimbal, famous name Bad, and welcome back to the end of the Seven Dice. We are traveling through space and time. You know how you do. It's been pretty good. Got to stop by a lovely market. Uh, the nice thing about traveling throughout space and time is that you can stop by on those those sale days every single time. I'm saving so much money. This is wonderful. I don't know why everyone doesn't do this. Hopefully I don't have any like time cop issues or anything like that. I'm sure it's fine. Anyways, travelers, thanks for popping on by. Always happy to see you and hope you're enjoying this lovely tale. Third episode. Oh my goodness, we're really just hitting the ground running. Let's have a nice little fun fact. Did you know that Carcosa Online, the video game that the players are trapped in, takes place in the very world of Loch Railta? You're probably wondering, wait a minute, what's Loch Railta? Well, that's the very world that the story Rise of Nyarlathotep takes place in. The city of Carcosa is located in the Foundry of Steel, one of the northern kingdoms ruled mostly by humans. Very industrial, good times I had there, people say. A lot of unions are set up that try to fight back against the corporations that rule over the country itself. What fun! Well, travelers, I don't want to take too much of your time today. But if you'd love to support the show, head on over to the Atunes and the Spotify and leave us one of those five-star reviews. Give us the strength and power to fight against the dark forces of the algorithm so that we can shine this story and bring it to others throughout your planet of... The Earth. The Earth? Earth? Earth. Yes, help us bring this story to the denizens of Earth. Also, if you're interested in another way of helping out, head on over to our Patreon. It is a dollar minimum, pay what you want. You can listen to all sorts of audio drama goodies, one-shots. We keep on uploading stuff up there. Uh, I heard word on the street is that they are trying to upload the episodes one week in advance, the audio form of the episode. So if you want the sneak peek, if you just can't wait, head on over to our Patreon. Uh, check that out. Also, there is a brand new audio drama that's been uploaded there called Forging of the Bright Blade. It all takes place around a gnome who has to create a blade of power, and they're dealing with a, a very tricky and somewhat malevolent AI. So check that out, Forging of the Bright Blade, quite the tale. Many wonderful voices contributed to bringing that to life. All right, travelers, you know what time it is. Everyone loves listening to a cursed radio. This up here. Oh, the buttons always change on this thing. You think that it's a magic item, it would always stay the same. Here we go. Let's see what we got. Hey, listeners. My name is Dave Cole, and I'm the dungeon master and host of a Dungeons and Dragons podcast called. Ah, wait, Dave, say no more. They'll be enchanted by one of my songs, and then they'll be hooked. No, they want to hear about how we slay great beasts. No, they want to hear about magic and sorcery and spellcasting. They will listen for the story, the rich history, the lore, or we can just roll the dice and let fate decide. You're right. If you haven't listened to The Four Orbs yet, find us at www.fourorbs.org or whatever podcast app you use. Well, that was lovely, wasn't it, Travelers? Always fun seeing what this cursed radio is going to bring us. At least it doesn't bring out all those strange demon noises and whatnot. Had a book one time, found my name in it, very concerning, and a list of many demon names and angel names. But yeah, no, wasn't that bad. Alright, travelers, I have to get back to telling the rest of this tale. I bid you all adieu. Hero points. Uh, we we using those? Yeah, I think so. I, I like the idea of them. Oh, they refresh every hour, actually. Oh, do they? 
Oh, okay. They're not something that you have to give? Yeah. You get one every hour of gameplay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you can, but yeah, they just refresh every hour of gameplay. Okay. Or you or say refresh. You get one. So if you don't use any, you have three if you've gone through three hours. Okay. Sweet. Well, that sounds better to me. And what do those do? Whenever you roll, if you get a low roll, you can spend a hero point to re-roll. It's not advantage, it's just a re-roll. Yeah, you can also, uh, if you go down uh, but haven't died yet, you can spend all of your hero points to stabilize. So you're not, like, don't have to worry about dying, like, go, like rolling for dying conditions. So, Nestle, you look around this area, you see a number of different skeletons are climbing out of the ground. A fair amount of them are starting to move towards all of you. You see it, there are other adventurers in the area, and some of them are looking panicked, they don't know what to do. Others are looking like they're about ready to fight. Uh, but it looks like the four of you have been somewhat backed into a corner. Is it uh, enough to say that I, uh, when I started seeing weird things starting to happen, I pulled up my gun? Yeah, that's safe to say. Cool. So I am going to start my turn off with looking at probably the one that is um, sort of behind us on our our right. Mm. And I am going to devise a stratagem. I'm doing this so and just like character ability and like looking for its weaknesses. Mm. And also while I am doing this, I have a feat called Known Weaknesses. And when I devise a stratagem, I, I can do a uh, free recall knowledge check to see what I know about said creature. Sure. For my devise a stratagem roll, which I, I essentially use this instead of rolling for an attack, I got a 19. Devise a stratagem lets me use my intelligence modifier rather than my dex modifier to shoot my gun. Nice. And what did you get for your recall knowledge? I got a 13. That's a DC. All right, so you are looking at these creatures and well, things are popping into your head. Knowledge that you yourself, as Ryan, you don't have this knowledge, but Nisla seems to just be pouring this information into your head. You're looking at these skeletons. You understand that cold, electricity, and fire are gonna be having a hard time like properly damaging these creatures. And piercing and slashing aren't gonna be as effective as they normally would either. You know, I just immediately say, stay away from like cold and fire, piercing and slashing, your best bet. And anybody who uses my information to attack them uh, gets a plus one circumstance bonus to their next attack roll. And then I will use, well, second action, attack with my device stratagem with my gun. So that is a uh, 25. 25 to hit. Nine damage total, six of it is piercing and three of it is precision then my last action will be to reload my gun. You fire this gun and it just blasts out. The skeleton looks towards you for a moment as it starts opening up its maw and then it just explodes. Just bones flying everywhere. As you just spin, turning around, you, know, you have your pistol, you're quickly reloading it. And the motion feels so fluid, like you've done this every day of your life. And that skeleton was destroyed. And we go from Nisla to Akihiko. As he was moving forward, a, a skeleton popped up in front of him. And two things kind of happened. A, a feeling that he's not familiar with starts taking over his body, but also just the feeling of, like, gamer danger. It's time to move. He starts twirling his staff in his hands as he begins charging up uh, electricity as he's going to make a spell strike. 15 to hit. As an unfortunate miss. But you know what? I'll just spend the hero point and we'll try again. Why not? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> no. Uh, so, just, uh, what happens is, like, lightning charges along the staff as he swings it, which goes very wide, very, very wide. Uh, well, not very wide. It was too off, but it goes a little wide um, and doesn't hit the creature. As he's just, like, recentering himself thinking like, oh, I've, I've never moved like this before. I have to get used to this. But he brings his hands together along the staff as he takes the electricity into his body and will use his third action to cascade. And so electricity just like begins to run and course along his, uh, his skin 
and like a secondary energy barrier kind of forms around him and around his ears and around his a tail. It's pretty anime, so to speak, for this Love it. Uh, yeah. weeb child. But uh, that is his turn. You swung the skeleton, just barely managed to avoid this blow. As the electricity is arcing over you, we go to Loon. To Loon, you are looking these other companions around you. You see that they're, you know, one of the skeletons exploded, one was missed, and there is still quite a few that are around you. Oh, there's this one to my left? And then I tried crouching to get near it, but I was glowing, so I just tried to pretty much hit it with my staff. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> you would add your strength and your proficiency, <laughs> which is not going to make it my friend. You swing the staff, and uh, it just, the skeleton raises a shield, and it sort of clangs off of it as it pushes your staff away. And then, as my staff, like, gets up, Swing again. <laughs> yeah. Why not? There's always you a might get a 20. Okay, okay. The second swing. Swing, better, better. Oh! 20. All right, <laughs> okay. How we do criticals in our game. The first die is always maxed out because I believe that a critical should do more damage than a regular hit no matter what. So just roll your damage and then you add the, the first one maxed out. So... So roll a d8 uh, plus one from your strength. Uh, one plus one. You're still doing 11 points of damage. So you you missed the first time, and frustration wells up within you, and you bring this staff down, just shattering the head of the skeleton as it just falls into pieces. Gamer rage. <laughs> <laughs> the power of law. We go from Loon to these skeletons. So these skeletons are going to try to swing at each of you. So first, Loon. One comes in with this just hearty swing, and you watch as the blade flies in the air at you. You're figuring, it's just a video game, whatever. You take three points of damage. You're a human being. You went to... Law school. You did not participate in getting stabbed with a sword. <laughs> that hurt so damn much. You scream in pain. <laughs> There's blood. And this was not supposed to happen in this game. You made sure that you looked through all the rules. You're like, okay, it's not really going to hurt, so it's fine. But that hurt <laughs> so much. <laughs> and the three of you hear Loon scream out as you watch these swords all starting to swing towards all of you. Hmm. Fear. Yes. I don't like that at all. <laughs> Morgan, one is swung at you. What is your AC? 19. So fear is a great motivator and a wonderful teacher as you just dodge out of the way of that skeleton swinging. Nisla, one is coming at you. What is your AC? 16. All right, so this one's coming in four, five points of damage. It hurts so much. Fuck. You see people all over, all their places. like, what the fuck? Oh my God. And like, people are getting stabbed. And like, before they're ready to fight, they're swinging their weapons, casting their spells. And then like one slash and like, nope, <laughs> this isn't cool. And two are coming for you, Akihiko. That'll hit. That one will not. <laughs> You manage to dodge out of the way. You're like, looking good. But then the other blade comes in, stabbing right into you. Ouch. <laughs> For a eight points of damage. Ouch. That hurts a lot. This look, you, I mean, you just see him take a, a really solid hit. But like, he doesn't, he reacts like it definitely, he felt it. But he doesn't stop like that kind of thing where people who feel pain, like they hesitate. And they just, it just doesn't. He's just like, this is the thing that's happening to me now. You know, one tough cat boy <laughs> beside you. The toughest cat uh, boy. He's <laughs> gone through a lot of surgeries and a lot of pain. <laughs> that electricity around you, uh, does that have any effect on the skeleton that hits you? No, it's only whenever I attack with my weapon that it will do extra damage Okay, cool. of that type. All right, and then we go to Morgan. So there is a skeleton in front of you and a skeleton to your side. We're gonna go for the one that is in front of me. So the one that's like out a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're still like 
Not really entirely sure what's going on here. We've just kind of panically jumped out of the way. So Morgan is gonna just try and punch this thing. So you you go in for a punch, but it just goes right beside because you're not used to these light bird bones. You just punch right past it as you pull your fist back. She's gonna try again. So she kind of flails out the first time. Not really used to the body, the reach, a little smaller than we're used to. So she's she's phased a little bit, but she's going again. You go in with this fist and you just you're swinging in. And does it have the damage? So go ahead and roll 1d6 plus 2. You punch and explode the skeleton in front of you. Bone bits flying everywhere. You feel incredible because you've always wanted to punch so many people at work. And you, <laughs> you just turn back towards, and there's one still beside you. It's always a chance for a critical. She she throws out the left, it misses, but she like, she's like, okay, I think, like, I got my range a little bit. She comes back in, knocks the skeleton out, and now she's just feeling it. She's vibing with it, and she's just gonna, like, kind of pivot on the one foot with this momentum and try and hit the other one. So you bring this kick around and it misses this uh, the skeleton as it just kind of moves out of the way. And you do like a little bit of a spin, not expecting this much momentum, not expecting like, you know, the power that's coming from this body. And you, you catch yourself just uh, now looking over at the skeleton that's fighting Nisla. And we go from Morgan to Nisla. For a... Uh free action, I will release the gun that I'm holding uh, and use my first action to pull out my short sword. Then for my second action, I will devise stratagem on the skelly boy in front of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, that is an 18. All right, so that's a hit. Roll that damage. Five damage total, three slashing, two precision. All right, so your sword clatters into the skeleton. It's still up, but it looks like it, you know, it took a little bit of this hit, but it rolled a lot with it. And I uh, will use that to just swing at it once more. Why not? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is going to be a six. So you you swing, you hit it, and you feel like it's kind of a little bit jarring in your wrist. You're not used to like these sensations. You go to swing again, and it was just not the right swing as the skeleton just kind of backs away a little bit. And it goes to Akihiko. A, a small bell kind of chimes as he, like, slowly uh, begins to, like, spin his staff, but then picks up a little bit of momentum as he swings it at once at one to his right, and then switching hands in the middle of that action, uh, instead of which was two-handed to before, now is one-handed as he uh, swings it at the second one. So, let's do the numbers. 18 to hit. Yep, that hits. And then the second one, which will not hit. So it's going to do seven bludgeoning damage and one electricity damage you explode the skeleton in front of you the electricity just crackles along the bones as they all just clatter to the ground and you spin towards the other one swing your staff but you you missed it by a mile as you heard just once again you're also getting used to this momentum of your new body and then with his last two actions, however, uh, with his spell strike recharged, is just going to go run uh, one hand that isn't holding the staff uh, along the length. As a cat appears, uh, just a, or say the, the image of a cat's paw appears, as he just swings it down with a cat's meow, as he uh, casts Gouging Claw at it. Nice. So it is going to be a 17 to hit. That's a hit. Four bludgeoning damage, one electricity damage, and two plus five piercing damage. So with a meow, you explode another one. So you have just bones littered around you as you look over and you see like two more just shambling towards. So now there are four skeletons left. We go to Loon. So Loon, are you summoning your Eidolon? Yep. You just weirdly dropped his stick, picked it up, and circled it, trying to hit, and he summoned an Eidolon. What does it look like? Oh, it pretty much just... I guess it's a mirrored version of me, since... So it won't be that hard to... You know, it won't be that hard to think of. 
So it appears right near you in the skeleton, and I believe it can take one action when you summon it. Oh, I guess for the Eidolon, it's just... What's that thing, Dendro? I'm going to strike at the creature. Yep. Yeah, so it has an unarmed strike that's plus seven, and it does a d6 plus four. Eleven. So plus seven, 18 is a hit. So roll 1d6 plus four. Then. So you summon this mirror version of you, who then turns towards you. You feel an intense connection with this other being, as they give you a nod, turn towards, and what does the attack look like as it, it, it uses this tendril? I guess its arm just turns into a spring, and then it straightens and plunges it through. Nice. It just shatters the skeleton in front of you, and just like bits and pieces go flying, like a, the skeleton's head goes through somebody's window. And then you turn towards everyone else, and you see that the other three skeletons are there fighting, uh, and two of them are shuffling on up. So one skeleton shuffles up to you, Morgan, and another one comes up to you, Akiko, and all three are going to swing one at each of you. So a 25 on Morgan, a 25 on Nisla, and a 26, a natural 20 oh, on Jesus. Akihiko. Oh. <laughs> Technically wouldn't crit without that 20. <laughs> These skeletons aren't messing around. So. It's nice knowing you. I'm probably going down for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan, you take seven points of damage. Nisla, you're taking five. And Akihiko, you are taking 13. As this thing just plunges its sword right through you. Nisla, you're standing right beside Akihiko, so like the blood splatters onto your face. And as they rip the blade out, you watch Akihiko just collapse down to the ground. And it goes to Morgan's turn. We don't like that. Nope. <laughs> Morgan is... She just got hit. She's in pain, and now she's actually kind of mad that the feelings are so acute. And she is going to attack this one directly in front. Uh, and I think for this one, we're gonna try a flurry of blows. Your first one hits with a resounding explosion as the skeleton just bursts into pieces and falls down to the ground. And then you, you bring in your other swing on the other skeleton, but it, it misses. So I, I think at that point, happy to have killed off the skeleton that attacked me, but also feeling frustrated with sort of inconsistency that we're having with hitting. Because I think at this point, Morgan is at like every other one is hitting. <laughs> you just keep punching that one in front just of keep going. <laughs> You know what? Yeah. I don't know if that's a crit fail or not because oh that I am because looking, it is yeah. it is ten below ten yeah. above is a, is a critical hit ten below is a critical miss. So you go in and so once again you're trying to get used to this body. You go in for you know the one punch you explode a skeleton. You bring your fist around this hammer strike and you miss and you go and try to do a kick and you lift your other foot off the ground as well. And you're like. No, wait, <laughs> because you needed both. And then you go and you don't successfully catch yourself. You crash down onto the ground. Uh, the skeleton's going to try to take a swing at you. So you feel the blade sink into you as you take seven points of damage. What's your HP at? Six. Okay, so you're still good. You're still alive. You're currently on the ground looking up at the skeleton. As it's glaring down at you, these eyes are lighting up. But you watch as the little flickers and flames are in this skull, and they're slowly turning and mutating as you're watching as actual eyes are starting to form. Just gonna look on in horror. <laughs> like Morgan is, is on the ground, just got stabbed again. Ren Akihiko is now on the ground and just like for the first time since this started like really starting to feel that fear and that that last proclamation of if you let the last bits of life leak from your pathetic frame you will die in your miserable dimension 
just sort of flashes across her mind as she's staring into these like mutating flame eyes. Do one more action. Do I? You could stand up. I I would like to do that. You do that sweet like you know like you kick your legs out and you're you're up. We go from Morgan to Nisla. I think this is starting to freak out a little bit. There's a lot that's going on. Uh, people are down and injured. And then just like something pops up on her HUD that says battle medicine. And she's like, that looks important. And selects it. Uh, and I'm going to battle medicine Akihiko. All righty. I'm going to roll the medicine check. Uh, I think DC 15. No, that's actually not going to be enough. So I'm going to spend my hero point. Yes, that is. That is going to be a 20. Uh, that is 11 hit points back to Akihiko. Breathing is so much easier now. <laughs> <laughs> and then I will turn and for my second action, battle medicine Morgan. Yep, yeah, that is going to be a 23. Alrighty. 14 HP back to Morgan. And with my last action, I will take a swing at the scary zombie skeleton flesh thingy in front of me. Yeah, skin starting to grow on it, muscle. Just fucking die! 17. That hits. Four slashing damage. You slash at this creature, and you, it's like started to grow skin and muscle all over. It has like a mostly human arm, and you just lop it off. As it like falls to the ground, and the creature just starts to stumble, and then just starts falling apart. We see the one above Akihiko is, it's almost like the, the blood is soaking up into its legs and its legs are starting to form. From Nisla, uh, Akihiko. Stand, because he doesn't want to be on the ground anymore. And then is going to attack the one in front of him. Mm -hmm. That is not going to hit. <laughs> <laughs> and he will spend his last action uh, to cast shield on himself. Hopefully that will save his HP. We go to Loon. As for Loon, he just goes straight to the skeleton, like right here. And then he thinks that just because his clone has a tendril, he has one too. So he just goes for a straight punch at the skeleton. <laughs> roll, roll the hit. I mean, he doesn't know if, he's, if a tendril is going to come out, but well, nothing will come out. You might have spells. You swing, and it just raises its shield, and you punch the shield, and you're like, Ha! Oh! <laughs> you're holding your hand. And he's shouting, Tendril, come on. <laughs> oh, I have one more action. Well, as a struggle, he just throws another punch. Just, you know, imagining that a Tendril will come out. He thinks that he has to imagine a Tendril. So he throws another punch, thinking a Tendril will come out, and he rolls a seven. So you're, you're swinging at this creature. The skeleton turns around, kind of confused, and <laughs> it swings back at you. Uh, but it also misses. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just these two people flailing at each other while there's just shattered skeleton and fleshy skeleton everywhere. Uh, and now it's formed about up to the waist, it seems to be uh, formed. And it looks human, uh, strange enough. From the creatures, it goes to Morgan. We're gonna move over to it, and uh, we're gonna just try and hit it. That's that's the master plan here. It's the, it's the monk way. <laughs> I just want to like stress this whole like half flesh, half skeleton situation is really gross for her. So it's no one's favorite. Uh, oh. You can't really see it because the the facial expressions of the bird are very subtle. But I just want you all to know that if she had more of an expressive, allowing face, she would look absolutely appalled at this thing. And now she's gonna try and hit it. It's a crit. You destroy, <laughs> the upper half just explodes and then the bottom half just sort of splats onto the ground. You all look around. There are people screaming. There are other skeletons in the distance fighting. People are bringing them down. You see there are dead players everywhere. You're, you're panicking. You're looking over yourselves. One of you opens up your, your menu. And it says, players online. 
10,928. Escaping Carcosa is brought to you by the Ballad of the Seven Dice Network. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram by searching Ballad of the Seven Dice. Supporting our Patreon helps us pay for the show, such as hosting, equipment, and additional content for you to enjoy. Our Patreon is pay what you want. It contains behind-the-scenes footage, audio dramas, one-shots, and more. You can also head over to iTunes and Spotify and leave us a five-star review. Every review helps us fight against the horrors of the algorithm. Until next time, dear travelers, keep an eye out for that yellow side.